Well, our program tonight is our own Bud Quark. And Bud, I think this is your title right now. Are you the coordinator for the National Horticulture Chapter? The Horticultural Committee. The uh, Horticulture Committee. There's a number and, of other committees underneath the umbrella of the Horticultural Committee, yeah. Uh, but he is, he's the big boy. He's in charge of all horticulture for the National Garden Club. And I have been to his meetings and he has lots of information and lots of encouragement for everyone to get out there and work on uh, planting the right plants and trying to uh, control the invasives. And um, Bud has all kinds of wonderful programs. He's a bee man, he's a gardener. So I'm going to turn this over to Bud and surprise us with something good tonight, Bud. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about ed my edible gardens. My edible gardens, I'm the chairman of the edible gardens also for the uh, National Garden Club. And that edible gardens right now is under my horticulture umbrella. Edible gardens, uh, I became the chairman of that uh, uh, committee under Nancy Hargrove uh, back in 2017. She asked me to do that. And the gay Austin, the next president, asked me to continue to do that and also be coordinator for the horticultural uh, committee. And then Mary Warshar, who's now our president, National Garden Club president, asked me to do the same thing. So I'm still Edible Gardens chairman. Now, back in uh, when Nancy uh, gave me the, um, the, the yeah, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this is there's there's six there's six panels on on the uh, the uh, trifold. Uh, they encouraged us to do trifolds back in 2017. The gar uh, we were under the umbrella of garden uh, committee, which were, there were like 21 different committees under the garden committee, including mine. And some of us went ahead and got the did the did the uh, trifold. A little interesting story. I was told that a prison would do the trifold really reasonable. And I went ahead, took a chance and let them do it in its full color and glossy. And it was about a fourth of the price of what uh, Office Depot and those kind of guys wanted to do it. I think it was, cost me $250 for 1,500 of them. They're almost all gone. Uh, we put them in the bags at the, at the conventions and what have you. And I don't know if you can read this or not. I, I um, I can't. I'm on my phone. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and read these panels just in case you, they are too small for you. Um, there is sometimes I think that uh, the individual gardeners that um, they don't realize that they may belong to a federated garden club, but they're also a member of the Kentucky Garden Club, and they're also a member of the South Atlantic region, and they're also a member of the National Garden Club. And I, I think sometimes they forget that, that, that they, they just, you know, they kind of think they're, that's their, like the Laurel Oak Garden Club I belong to, they, they all belong to that club, and they forget that they belong to the National Garden Club and the Garden Club of Kentucky. Um, down there at the bottom, well, first of all, the Plant America uh, is on there because the, I did that for Nancy uh, Hargrove and she started that plant America. That was one of her mottos. We all got uh, badges to plant America and that has it's stayed. Uh, Gay kept that and then now, uh, uh oh, I've got a phone call coming. <laughs> How's it? I don't know how that worked. Uh, so I can't see the screen right now. My phone is. Let's see if I, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose you here. Let me see. No, I didn't. I got a phone call on that. Have you ever had a phone call while you're Zooming? It, it, it uh, overrid, overrode, overridded. Anyhow, Plan America is still, uh, uh, for Mary Warshaw, is still keeping Plan America, but her motto also says play outside. She's encouraging people to go outside. And right below that, there's another uh, little disclaimer. It says that if you wanna see any of my shows, you can just go to YouTube and punch in Bud Quok, Q-U-A-L-K, 
in the search window and it'll bring most of my shows up. Some of my shows are way before YouTube was even invented. And I, I've got two shows there. One's a, a, a community service spotlight where I interview charities. You probably don't want to watch those, but uh, the, the um, uh, Master Gardener show, we have almost a show about just about any plant or vegetable you can think of, um, 30 minute show. Uh, so you might check that out if you're looking for something uh, to Google. Okay, next, next slide. Uh, by the way, there's six, six, six panels on here on this. Uh, and this is the first one, it's edible flowers. Uh, many people don't think about edible flowers and I'm going to read off some of these. These are just a few, there's dozens and dozens of edible flowers, but you probably have these in your garden, bee balm, elderflower, passion flower, nasturtium, pansy, marigold, spiderwort, clover, zinnia, pansies, violets, nasturtiums, roses, calendulas, sweet peas, marigolds, anise, honeysuckle, common daisies, and there are dozens more. Uh, just put a few pansy blooms on top of your salad and see all the compliments you receive. Use as a garnish or right on top of that pot roast. It's not fattening and extremely ornamental. Okay. Um, there's a couple things go along with the flowers. Uh, you do not want to eat flowers that you buy from the nursery or Lowe's or any of the box stores. There's no telling what was put on those flowers. So no, only eat flowers that were grown in your garden and you know exactly what's, what's on them. The other thing is you want to wash them really well. There's little tiny bugs that can get in these flowers and you don't want to end up eating any bugs. Um, just because the flower is edible doesn't mean that the plant is edible. The plant may be poisoned. So eat the flowers, don't eat the plants. And to be sure, you want to be sure that it's one of the flowers you well, any of these flowers that I've said on that I've mentioned on here are, but if you have one that's not on, on this uh, trifold, you want to make sure it is edible because there are some, some poisonous ones out there. I know some that, are, that maybe kill you if you ate them, I think. Okay, and I, I, I've opted to take questions as we go. Uh, is there any, Anybody got any comments or questions on edible flowers? I don't. I don't hear anything. Is is uh, how do you, how do you do the questions? Uh, people can put them in the chat. The chat is empty at this point, and we're a small group, so I'm going to let people unmute themselves. And uh, but when you're done talking, just please mute yourself back so that we don't have quite so much uh, background noise. Would say that was that last part again. Do what? Uh, if you unmute yourself, please remember to put yourself back on mute when you're done asking your question. Oh, so okay. Well, I, I didn't have any plans to, to mute myself, but you, you, you shouldn't. You're, you're talking all the time. You, you should not. Okay. Anybody got any questions for Bud? Most people don't have a whole lot of question about edible flowers. <laughs> They are neat, though, especially as, as a garnish. Okay, next slide, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a couple of uh, couple of plants that I have. I have a bunch of edible flowers. My this is a, a spiderwort. It's it is uh, uh, edible. And next slide. I used to have. I've had always. I love cut. Zinnias. I have zinnias all over the place normally, but I had a virus in my greenhouse that killed all the zinnias. Didn't well, didn't kill them. It just made them look stupid. Uh, so I bought these little little zinnias. This is the only zinnias I have in my garden, and that's very unusual for my my garden. But those are edible. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, berries. That's the next category of edible. Uh, food, berries, um, and I'll read that one. You get the blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, boysenberries, and many, many more. Nothing matches going into the garden in the morning, and I used to do this all the time, to pick berries for your cereal or your fruit salad. Doesn't take much room, as you might think, and you need to know exactly what chemicals you are not eating. Um, and go to the next slide.
Okay, these, these are strawberry. Yeah, this is strawberries. My son lives in California. He sent me some seeds. Uh, these are strawberry plants that I grew from seeds in my greenhouse. And they're in a container because we only had a few plants. Uh, you can see there, there are some red ones there. They're, they're not your big, huge strawberries that I was hoping for. <laughs> he gave me a variety that has relatively small uh, uh, berries on it. Um, you can grow these in, in containers. Uh, they, they make containers specifically to hold strawberries. Many of the other berries you, you wouldn't want to uh, grow in, in, in containers. If you grow just a few berries, you want to also buy some netting because the birds will eat the berries before you can get them. I'm, I'm talking about blackberries, red raspberries, strawberries, blueberries. The birds will eat them first. So you've got to get netting if you're just going to have a few. Now, if you've got quite a, quite a, a, a large uh, uh, area of berries, and I've had, I've had uh, large areas, then the, you can, the birds are competing with you, but you, you, there's plenty for everybody. And that's even the best way to do it. Um, I had a 20 foot row of, of tame blackberries. And you know, you know, the wild blackberries, they've got the thorns and you will get stuck if you pick uh, wild blackberries. When the wild blackberries turn black, they are ripe and they're sweet as heck. The tame blackberries, when they turn black, they're not ripe yet. You gotta wait for those little cells to plump up. And when you reach in to pick them, they fall right off in your hand. That's, that's when they're dead ripe. But if you just pick them when they first turn black, they're gonna be really sour. But I had about 20 foot row and I had, had them fenced up and I would get five gallons, five to 10 gallons worth of blackberry wine off of there every year and all the berries I could eat. So it doesn't take a whole lot of room to have a lot of berries. I've grown red uh, raspberries also. Uh, there are some tricks to the both of those on when to, to uh, cut the canes out. Uh, I think the blackberries, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that because I haven't done it this in a while. I think the blackberries are on the second year's growth. And then after that, you can cut them out and cut those canes out of there and get them out of there because they're not going to have any more blackberries on them. I think the red raspberries are exactly the opposite, but I could be wrong. Um, but it is worthwhile if you've got a little bit of ba backyard, instead of having grass, grow you some uh, berries. Um, I almost, grapes are fruit, uh, but I almost uh, wrap, wrap them in up, up in with the berries also. Grapes are extremely high maintenance. I don't know how wineries do it extremely high maintenance on uh, chemicals and also on the pruning. Pruning is outrageous. Um, let me see if I've skipped anything. Uh, I have uh, the blueberries. I killed probably a dozen blueberry plants before I finally got my, uh, my little raised bed where they were acid enough. I think most berries, or at least many berries, like acid soil. Uh, blueberries like it real acid, I think 4.5 to 5 pH. And uh, once I finally got it and put the netting on there and kept the birds out, I could go out every morning and pick two dozen berries and put them on my, my cereal. And does everybody know what pH means? I, it took me a long time and I had to go to a biology professor to find out what pH, nobody, you, you, nobody knows what it means. <laughs> well, I didn't anyway, and I was a master gardener. <clears throat> it's a, it has to do with hydrogen, the hydrogen in the soil or how much hydrogen the soil can contain. I'm not a biologist, so I don't know exactly how that works, but I think that the H and the pH is hydrogen. It, could, it sounds like it would be percentage hydrogen, but I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to say that's exactly what it is, but it's, that's really getting into the specifics. <laughs> okay, any questions on, on berries? Do I need to mute, mute myself, you said? You should not mute yourself. But, oh, but. but don't mute yourself. Okay, I, I didn't mute myself. Okay, I'm back. Okay. So starting your strawberries from seed, how long did that take you to get a berry? Uh, from seed? Yes. Uh, I planted the seeds probably 
in uh, late February. Uh, so uh, I'm just getting them now, but this is not the strawberry that you that you probably used to at the farmer's market. You can see the little, they're, they're, they're about the size of your little fingertip is all the bigger they are, but they're just coming on right now. So February to, to the middle of June, six months, no, that's four months and four, four months. But you can buy the plants at the box stores if you in the nurseries if you'd rather not wet, do the seeds. But yeah, four those months. Almost, those almost look like alpine strawberries. They sure do. Uh, they sure do. And I've grown alpine strawberries. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure these are alpine. Uh, the the, the uh, seed packet didn't say anything about alpine on it, but they're in that same category. You're right. Um, I've grown those before and. They really weren't worth the work, you know, because you have to have a lot of alpine strawberries to have <laughs> anything to eat. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. yes, you're exactly right. <laughs> I'm not going to get a, a, a probably a cup of, of total strawberries off this off these plants. And there's probably about 20, 20 plants right there, believe it or not. Well, something uh, that we've done with our regular strawberries, because I had a bad probably um, six by 15 so of strawberries and they were in the ground and I'd like for you to guess how many berries that we got off of those competing with the rabbits. Oh, the rabbits were in there with not the birds, just the rabbits. The rabbits were the problem. None. <laughs> None. I, I would <laughs> bet you got quite a few of uh, strawberries out there. Um, now that we have built us a raised bed, um, it's really like a table with a top that's about 10 inches deep. Uh -huh. Those are doing very well. They have netting over them so the birds can't get to them. And we think that we have finally, after probably 20 years of playing with strawberries off and on, have gotten to the point that we can have strawberries. I'm sorry, I'll let you get back to your program. No, no, no we got, we've got plenty of time. They gave me three hours to talk. Uh, okay. What? No, 30 minutes? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, the raised beds, I love raised beds. I, I've grown all my vegetables right now in my backyard. You know, all the vegetables are all in raised beds. The herbs are all in raised beds. They're so much better than just planting them out in a row. Of course, some people don't have the, the, the choice. But if you do have the choice, the braised beds are good for everything. I love them. Uh, mine are about eight or 10 inches deep too. Any other questions? Next slide then. Okay, we're fruit, fruits and nuts. And I'll read that really quickly, apples, peaches, Pears, cherries, plums, apricots, oranges, lemons, and limes. Now, by the way, I've grown every one of those. Uh, instead of planting those flowering trees, plant the real thing and get the fruit also. The, the blooms are just as good on the, on the fruit trees as they are on the ornamentals. I, I never understood why people did that. Um, <clears throat> plant the real cherries instead of the flowering cherries. Plum trees bloom first in the spring and the blooms are to die for. Um, I used at another house. I grew uh, uh, what's that plum? Uh, little little gold plum, shiro plum, the shiro plum, and it's a little gold and sweet as ever. And the, the tree uh, is first to bloom before even the cherries. It didn't. It doesn't even have uh, the the blooms on the ends of the of the branches. It ha it's it encircles all the branches with uh, white blooms. I mean, it's just beautiful, beautiful. And then you get out, then unless the freeze comes and gets those blooms, which happens from time to time because they bloom so early, uh, you're gonna get all these beautiful gold uh, plums and they, they don't have a whole lot of enemies as far as uh, diseases and, and uh, the birds like them. <laughs> the birds like everything. Uh, but uh, go ahead and change change the next slide and uh, we'll talk about cherries. Uh, I just planted two cherry trees. Uh, I've always had good luck with cherries. Uh, 
Uh, they don't have a whole lot of enemies either. Uh, I had to plant two because they, uh, for pollination and that goes for nut trees also. I had two pecan trees and they got 60 feet tall and they were really great pecans, but when the ice storm hit, it took one of the trees down. So then I had a 60 foot pecan tree with no pollination. So I didn't get any nuts, <laughs> but the cherry trees are the same way. And this is what my tree is gonna look like. This is the only slide in here. It's not at my house. This is the only one I got off the internet. And if you'll, that's, that's what my tree will look like in about three or four years. And next slide, so you can see what it looks like this year. I just planted it. Next slide. There it is. That, and the other one looks exactly the same. <laughs> they're nice and healthy, but they're going to be a while before I get any fruit off of them. Okay. Now, I, I, like I said, I've, I, I've uh, grown all those things. I lived in California just for a short period of time, and I had a lemon, a lime, and a navel orange tree in my backyard. Uh, out in California, they they have all these sweet oranges and and limes and lemons, and they they just let them rot on the trees. They don't even pick them. There's so many of them. Uh, I've grown apples and peaches, and they don't do as great in Kentucky as they do in other states. Uh, they have lots of enemies. They have the the the, the, the insects and the pests and the birds. And they have lots of funguses and diseases. So if you're going to grow apples or peaches, I hate to say it, but you're going to have to do lots of spraying. Uh, and you have to spray like once a week or once every 10 days if you want to get any fruit. And I, I did that. And sometimes I didn't even still didn't get any fruit. Now, on peaches, I learned a little trick. Um, I had an early white giant peach. And it, it matured and, and came, got ripe before, way before all the other peaches. And it would get ripe before all the diseases and stuff hit. So I, the, the diseases and stuff don't hit in the early spring, I guess. Uh, they come later. So if the, you've got a really early peach, I suggest you order a really early, early peach. You have a better chance of getting good peaches. And these things were giant too. They were white flesh and they were big around as softballs. Uh, but all my other peach trees didn't, didn't do worth their darn. So uh, any, any questions on, on fruit trees and nuts? No, no questions? I'm sorry. What was the name of your peach? Early White Giant. Early White, okay, thank you. I got it from Stark Brothers. I, I bet they still have it. <laughs> this they is my, have a good my supper. Sorry about that. My internet seems to be wonky today. So no other questions? Well, then we'll go to the next slide. This is, this is one of my favorites herbs. Martha Stewart told us one time that in the United States, we call them herbs. If you go to England, they call them herbs with an H, herbs. I would think that herbs would be the, does everybody out there use herbs or herbs? I would think herbs would be the, the, the way to go. And it's, it's, that's the way it's spelled, isn't it? But anyhow, Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, oregano, lavender, basil, tarragon, and chives. Many, many, many more, many more. And some of them are really, really neat. I'm gonna get in, we'll get into one, of, one or two of those. These are extremely easy to grow. Many come from the Mediter Mediterranean area where poor soil, soil and drought are very common. They are very flexible and enjoy growing in containers and best of all, many of them are perennials. I, you know, the majority of mine that I grow are perennials. Um, go ahead, and get the next slide. This is my backyard and I, I did away with the grass. Uh, I couldn't get the good grass to grow and I had a water problem. 
uh, when it rained uh, and all kinds of things. So I just went ahead and paved over my backyard, except for five raised beds and huge beds on all, all sides around the fence. Uh, this is to, to the left and bottom is a raised bed full of uh, my herbs, herbs, herbs. Um, this is the second year for my garden. Uh, I'm, I really am proud of it. Uh, I'd put an irrigation system in and that is the key. If I didn't, I'd be watering all day, every day in Western Kentucky, um, but I've got an irrigation system. I'd only have, to, only have to water a few places. But anyhow, there in, in, the, in the bottom, I don't, well, this is gonna be hard now because I don't have a, a pointer, um, but on the right side and the far in the back, um, that's borage. It's got blue, just hundreds of blue blooms on it, right in there. Yeah, that's it. Um, I grow, I don't know what borage is good for, <laughs> but those it's the the hundreds and hundreds of beautiful blue flowers is why I grow it. Now, just below it is is uh, oregano, and then down a little bit farther at the, at the edge on all four all four corners, I have rosemary plants. Uh, so, and then to the left of that right bottom corner is parsley, and then there's some more uh, oregano, I mean, uh, rosemary. And around that sundial, like you see the sundial in the middle, there's, there's rosemary all the way around that sundial. Okay, next slide. This is, this is it looking from the other side. Can you raise it up just a little, little bit? A little bit more. There you go. There you go. Okay, that's that rosemary in the middle, and the, in the on the left, far left side is mint, and then there's some more mint on the other side. You can't see it. I got a pot, two pots of mint. Of course, you don't want to let mint loose because it is very invasive. It uh, has rhizomes. I hate rhizomes. Uh, in the middle there is uh, the really low growing is thyme, and just to the right of thyme is chives. To the, to the left behind the pot there on the left is some uh, basil. So, and then there's some other stuff back in there. You can't see, can't see it. Um, let me see here. Uh, parsley, well, well the, the, the rosemary is a, is a perennial, perennial, but if you have cold winters here in Kentucky, it'll kill your rosemary. Of course, you all know that. There are some places around your house, and if it's, a, it's, it's a, got a little bit of a special climate, you can grow it for a while and the, and the winter won't hit it. But this last year, I, I had probably uh, 12 or 15 rosemary plants in this bed, and I didn't want to lose them. So I, whenever it was going to get real cold, I put... I, I put a uh, blankets and quilts over top of this and the sundial helped because it's up on top made like a TP. And I put three light bulbs in there. I ran three extension cords in there with light bulbs and I saved those rosemaries for a year. It was a lot of work, uh, but I hated to lose <laughs> all those rosemaries. So it, that's one little trick you might uh, keep in the back of your mind if you're, if you're like the rosemary. Uh, parsley. Uh, and you know a lot of this stuff already. It's a, it's a biennial. It won't bloom the first year, but it blooms the second year, and it gets kind of strong and, and a little bit ugly the second year. Uh, the thyme, the chives, and the mint are all perennials. Uh, the oregano in the back's a perennial. Of course, the uh, uh, basil is not a perennial. I have a little trouble with it when I when I when I plant the plants outside of my greenhouse when they're about six inches tall. I've got to cover them because the, the sun will burn them right now, and I won't have any basil plants. Once they get used to the sun and get a little taller, they they love the sun. Uh, I don't know if you guys have that problem or not with it burning the leaves on the on the basil. Um, let me see if I got. Thing. Oh, yes. Dill. Uh, there's a few dill plants in there. You can't see them, but I've got dill plants all over my garden. Um, 
in the next to the cucumbers, I've got a, maybe a half a dozen dill plants that are six, seven feet tall. Uh, of course, they're in those raised beds where I've got really rich soil. I put compost in there uh, every other year. I put in the raised beds. That's the way I, I, my, my plan is. I'll talk more about that when I get some tomatoes and peppers. Um, any questions about herbs? No, yes. Any questions? If I, yeah, we go, go through this pretty quickly, and I, that's 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 good for me. Um, do the vegetables? Yes, this is uh, I, this is my favorite, of course. Um, let me read what I have on there. Uh, tomatoes, peppers, corn, beans, squash, lettuce, cabbage, broccoli. Some of these can be grown in containers also, such as peppers, lettuce, and tomatoes. Look at your plate at supper. On average, your meal traveled 1,500 miles to reach your table. That's kind of shocking, but that's the way it is in the United States, unless you have a garden. If you have a garden, you can really reduce that. Um, next, next slide. I know this is hard to see. Uh, this, these are all in my garden. Yeah, raise it up just a little bit more. There you go. Um, these are raised beds. Uh, they're wonderful raised beds, by the way, it, and they're expensive <laughs> raised beds. Uh, these are my tomatoes. And right now, most of these tomatoes are about six feet tall. They're loaded with tomatoes. It's the best year I've had for, for tomatoes in a long time. Uh, they're in cages. Uh, I, I spent a whole weekend making cages for my tomatoes and my peppers a few years ago. I bought a big roll of uh, fencing wire with, with, it had squares in it big enough that you can reach inside. Don't get this, the, the wire where you can't reach inside the, the, two, the two small holes. And once I got going, once you've made one or two of, a, of the uh, cages and you got a, a system going down and you can make them pretty quickly. Uh, my beds are four foot wide and my all my beds are all my raised beds and the, to, the tomato cages are two feet in diameter so you can i've got side by side two 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 all the way down uh the length of the uh, raised bed and the, the peppers and uh, we'll go but i'm going to go back and forth between the peppers and tomatoes they, they were basically grow the same can you go down one slide maybe Okay, these are my peppers uh, and they're not as tall as the tomato plants. And I'll tell you why in a little bit, thank heavens. Uh, these are the cages, I better look at the cages and they're three uh, cage wise. So they're exactly four feet, three cages equals exactly four feet. So I got three by three by three by three all the way down the bed. Uh, this is a smaller uh, uh, raised bed. I, I, they, all the other ones are larger. So I think this one's only about 10 feet long or something. <coughs> I may be wrong, I can't remember. I've, I've slept since then. Uh, anyhow, I, I treat both of these the same, tomatoes and peppers, uh, almost on all levels. What I do in the fall, I uh, clean up the plants, take all the plants up, and they do not go to the compost because they're full of diseases. These. Uh, in Kentucky, especially Western Kentucky, we have lots and lots of funguses, 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 funguses. So you take your tomatoes and your peppers and you put them in the trash. They need to go to the uh, to the dump. Don't don't leave them out laying around. Don't leave them there laying over the winter. You got to get them cleaned up and get them the heck out of there, and put them in your trash bin. Okay, then I put a layer of compost on on all my raised beds. I have my own compost uh, pile going. And then I till that in with my little Troy tiller, little Troy tiller, but it's a four cycle and not a two cycle. So it doesn't need to mix the oil and the, and the gasoline. I hate doing that. Okay, so once I get, get the, 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 the compost tilled in, I, I have all these leaves from my trees. I, I try to mulch them up and I mean shred them up, but I don't always do. And I just, I put about a foot of leaves on top of the beds over the winter and then in the spring I take those leaves off I put those in the compost pile and then I spray this soil with a fungicide I have a I get one of those 
bottles that screw onto your uh, water hose, and I, it doesn't take but a minute. I spray uh, spray the spray the soil. Then I put black fabric over top of the, the bed. The fabric comes. Guess what? Four foot width. <laughs> it's perfect to run down the bed. This is really thin fabric. It's the water and the fertilizer goes right through it. You can get it at uh, your box stores and your nurseries. Uh, it's not thick and, and bad like the landscape fabric that you see. I hate that stuff. Uh, I, my house had it all around the house and I had to fight with it when I first started planting stuff. But anyhow, I put that down with staples and that, that, that uh, blocks the fungus. Not only does it mean there's no weeds all year long, there's no weeds and it helps block the fungus from getting up on the plants. The fungus lives in the soil and it splashes up on the lower leaves when it rains and when you water. And then it goes to the next set of leaves and up to the, all the way up the plant until the plant is pretty well stripped. Uh, the tomatoes are really bad about that. Uh, peppers, most of the time, they're, they're, their uh, leaves just turn black and fall off. And I have had that done. You've got to rotate your crops you can't grow peppers in the same place every year after year after year. And I digress. Okay, after I put that black fabric down, then I put the cages in place. And that tells me where that plant's going to go. So I pull the, pull the cage off one at a time or two at a time. And I take a scissors and cut an X in that fabric and plant the plant in that X right there. Then put the cage back on it. Once all the cages are back on, uh, I, I take twist ties and tie all those uh, cages together to make them one big cage because in the, in the, in the uh, tomato plant uh, bed, if you get a big wind to come along, it'll blow those cages over. I've had them do that. But if I've got them all attached together, unless it's a tornado, those cages aren't going anywhere. Okay. And then I take and I spray them again with fungicide. <laughs> and then every 10 days after that, I spray my tomatoes and peppers with fungicide. It doesn't take but a minute because I got that thing that screws on my, on my water hose and just, it really douses them really good. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's how I grow tomatoes. And you don't have to do exactly what I do, but you may be able to steal some of, the, some of that. I have plastic that is big enough that if it gets cold, if I planted my tomatoes too early, that will go over top of all these cages and be able to be, be blocked down on all sides so that the cold weather can't get inside. They, 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 they uh, sell that plastic 12 foot wide lengths, 100 feet long. So if you ever need any, any of that, you can, you can buy that at the hardware store or the box store or the nursery. I don't know if the nursery would have that or not. Now, not last year, but the year before last, I learned a valuable lesson. I thought, well, I'm pretty smart. I'm going to put nitrogen on my peppers and tomatoes. Bad idea. Have you ever seen eight foot peppers? I had eight foot tall. All of my peppers were eight foot tall. All my tomatoes were nine feet tall. I mean, they were the beautifulest plants you have ever seen. I didn't get any peppers or tomatoes, no fruit. I mean, you could count them on your hands how much I got. Uh, it was really sad. <laughs> I mean, and I got a guy that competes with me on tomatoes and he had a time with it. So I found out afterwards, some people say you never fertilize peppers, never. Well, you can if you do it in moderation. I put 15, 15, 15 on these. I just put just a tiny bit, a tiny bit on there. And they also said if you, it, it, if you wanted to get like 5, 20, 20, something with that first number, you know, that's the nitrogen number, that first number. So 5, 20, 20 meant it was very low nitrogen and uh, potassium and phosphate numbers were really high. So don't ever put <laughs> nitrogen on your tomatoes and peppers. And maybe you have done that before, I don't know. But it really was sad to have those big, beautiful plants. I mean, people were just amazed at how big they were. And I might as well have just pulled them up and throw them away. Okay, let me see. Yeah. 
I used to grow really hot peppers. <coughs> Last year, I grew the, the hottest three peppers. The California Carolina Reaper is the hottest pepper known to mankind. The uh, yellow Trinidad uh, scorpion is the number two, and the ghost pepper is number three. <coughs> you cannot eat these things. They use them in pepper spray, mainly. Uh, I To tell you how hot the Carolina Reaper was, I... I, I I um, dried about 60 of them. They, they really get lots of, they're very prolific. About 60 of them, I dried them and then I ground them up into uh, powder. And when I did that, I had two layers of plastic gloves on. Okay, I thought I was smart. <laughs> I pulled the gloves off and I didn't mean to, but I touched my nose but with one of my fingers outside side of my nose within 30 minutes i told my wife we were going to the emergency room i could not stand it anymore i mean the pain was so bad and she said well google it google it before you go to the doctor so i googled it and it said take a ripe tomato and cut it halfway in half and put that on the wound guess what within 10 minutes the pain was gone so remember that <laughs> if you really get hot peppers on you, get a ripe tomato and put it on the wound and you, uh, it'll take the, the heat away. Okay, that's, I'm getting way off the subject here. Any, any questions about tomatoes and peppers before we move on? Uh, I had a question. You mentioned getting rid of the old plants. If you burn them, will that make fungus spores go up in the air or will it kill yes. them? Yeah, don't burn them. Don't burn them. Okay. I, I've never burned them, but I've been told that that's, that's not a good thing. Okay. Uh, and I can see where it wouldn't be. It'd be the oil. Oil would go up into the air, and I, I don't know. I'm not a, but, but I think that's a bad idea. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You know, if you, if you, if you, you want to burn them instead of putting them in the trash pit, that's your idea. You know, I don't know. You might try it sometime. Put it in the neighbor's burn pile. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, what kind of fungicide are you using on your tomatoes? I use, uh, the, the, it, they, this, this says it's a, I can't remember the exact name, but it's a, it's a, it's a uh, it, it leads you to believe that it's safe for animals and stuff. Um, okay. <laughs> it's got a picture of, uh, of, of yeah, of, of something really nice on there. Uh, and I've used, different things with the same label and you'd think I'd remember the name of it but I, I just remember it's light almost white with light light green writing and stuff all over it uh it makes me believe that uh it, that, that with the name and it's safe for okay. animal stuff which means it's probably not as powerful <laughs> as the other stuff <laughs> which yeah but I I've used two or three different uh things in that uh uh I think one was the, uh, it, it had uh, to kill little mites and, and white flies. It was uh, soap, soap water, or whatever that's called, soapy water, something. But I get it at Lowe's. So if you look for a light, white, light green writing on a white okay. bottle, that, that's what I use. <laughs> okay, I'll look for it. Okay. And it's got, and it, I, I use the one with the hand sprayer, but I also on the beds, I use it, the one that can attaches to your, to your, to your garden hose. And they, there's a bunch of those at, at Lowe's and the, at the nurseries for different kind of applications where they attach to your, uh, I think seven had, you can get ones with seven uh, that attaches to a hose for insects. Okay. And I do use seven, so I think seven's not as bad as some of those other ones. Okay, okay, next next slide. Oh, this, oh wait, you already did it. It's there, there. <laughs> you're ahead of me. These are, this is my onion patch. It's a raised bed and the onions are almost all laying down. Uh, and I've got a pretty good long story to tell about onions. <laughs> onions, you, you say, well, onions are onions. You know, how? what's the big deal on onions? Um, I, I order my onions from an onion farm used to be you could not get the right onions 
buy the right onions locally. Uh, they, 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 all they had was the Granix onion that was for the Vidalia Swede and the, and the Wawa onion from Washington. And they were all Granix, believe it or not. They had different names, but they were all Granix and you couldn't get a very good variety. So I started growing my onions from an onion farm and they were guaranteed to be good and blah, blah, blah. And I order them in December. I tell, I, and they, you can tell them when to bring them, send them. I told them to send them to me the middle of February. They came in the middle of February, I immediately planted them. And I plant my stuff uh, early because I can cover it and I can protect it if something happens. I can handle any situation. So I plant them in February and when you plant onions, the bulb needs to grow above the ground. You don't want the bulb growing underground. So all you, you put the plants in the ground, just barely have the roots in the ground. And I have to go back every day for a couple of weeks and stick, stick the plant, some of the plants back in that fell out, that didn't, didn't stay in. Now you can use sets, but sets used to be red, white, and, red, and yellow, and they didn't have even names for most of them. But nowadays the sets now, you can get sets and I'll, I'll get back to this in a little bit later uh, with the exact, with the different uh, uh, days, short, medium and long day onions. You can get those on sets now. But anyhow, I like the plants better. So I do that, I plant them and then I immediately start putting nitrogen on them. Now every, every 10 days I spray them with nitrogen, not spray them. I, I have nitrogen in the, in the granules and I throw the, throw the granules on there. And the reason I, the, you do that is uh, the, the size of the onion is determined by how many spikes come off the plant, how many spikes there are. If you have five or six spikes off an onion, when it starts bulbing, and by the way, when the onion starts bulbing, the, the spikes quit growing. I mean, then you don't get any more spikes after it starts bulbing. But anyhow, if you have five or six spikes, you're gonna have a little bitty onion. If you have seven or eight or nine spikes, you're gonna have a nice size onion. And if you have 12 or 13 spikes, you're gonna have a great big onion. Okay, so the spikes, how many spikes you've got determines how big the onion is. Each spike is, is one of the, one of the uh, segments around the onion, one of the layers. So if you have, nine spikes, you'll have nine layers in onion. And that's how big your onion's gonna be. Okay, am I getting way out there yet? <laughs> okay, so when, when the onion starts bulbing, no more uh, spikes. So you quit putting nitrogen on there. So then the, as the bulb grows, it, and then finally, when it gets full growth, then the onion will fall down and hopefully the neck will break where the onion, right where the onion top of the bulb is, that'll fall over and it'll, the neck will break. And when the neck breaks, that means it starts healing the neck. And when it's all said and done and dried and that neck is sealed, that onion will keep for a long, long time. If that neck doesn't seal, that onion is not gonna live very long, not gonna last very long. It's not gonna keep very long. So, uh, when all the onions fall over and, mo and most of them have the necks broke, you take a, a rake or a hoe and you break, try to break the rest of the necks on those onions. If you don't break the necks, if the necks aren't broken, then it, it's not gonna last very long. And you wanna eat those onions first. You eat the onions that went to seed first because they're not gonna break, that's not gonna break over at all. So you eat those first. Then the next onions you eat are the ones that, that didn't seal, uh, didn't, the neck didn't break and you didn't seal for some reason. And when, you, when, the, when the onions all get brown and you, har the, you harvest them, you can tell if that neck is, is, is sealed good. It's all the way down and dry, it's not dry all the way to the seal. But if it's still got moisture in it and it's, and it's not gonna seal, then you can go ahead and cut it off anyway but put it in a pile to eat first. Okay, now I'm going to go all the way back. Well, by the way, when, when, you, when, you, when you harvest the onions, don't leave them out in the sun. They said, leave them out in the sun to dry. No, don't do that. Put them in the shade and don't let them get wet. Harvest them a, on a day that's real dry 
And if it's gonna be a heavy uh, dew or rain, take them inside. If you leave them outside, you might as well not even grow them. They're gonna go, well, never mind. Put them inside in the shed, put your car outside and put them in the garage floor, spread them out and let them dry for about a week or two. And then cut the tops off and store them according to whether they're gonna be Stores, the neck is dry or not dry and blah, blah, blah. Okay, now the most important thing about onions. <laughs> You're finally getting around to it. There's three categories of onions and it's not red, white, and, and, uh, and uh, yellow. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the days. The days that determine when the, the uh, okay. onion's gonna start bulbing. You got the short day, medium day, and long day. And most of you all know what I'm talking about. Short days are for the south because they grow them in the wintertime when the days are short. And then the medium days are for the middle of the country because we grow them during spring and early summer. And then the long days, onions are for the north because when it's a certain temperature on the short day, it gets to a certain temperature, it starts bulbing and it quits growing those spikes. Same way with the middle. The mid midday, those, but they, they don't stop. Um, the bulb doesn't start uh, forming until later, and then the long day is even longer. So, <clears throat> if you grow a short day onion in, in Kentucky, like the Granix, which is the Vidalia, it will it will start bulbing early, and you will have a little bitty onion. You will not have as big an onion as you should have. And oh, by the way, it's not gonna be sweet like a Vidalia anyway. The reason that Vidalia is sweet is mainly because of the soil and not because of the, what kind of onion it is and all that stuff. And we don't have the same soil here that, that Georgia does. I think something like low calcium or some, some soil, some way. Washington has it, Texas has some places in Texas. So don't think you're gonna get a Vidalia if you buy one of those Granix onions. Okay, so when you order your onions, make sure you get the me medium day, uh, medium day onion when you order your onions or look for them in box stores. Believe it or not, now box stores and nurseries are starting to get smart and they, you can find those now at the box stores. And even in the, cat, in the catalogs, you couldn't get them. They didn't have it in the catalogs until just the last couple of years. Now the catalogs are carrying short, medium, and long day onions. You can pick, pick and choose. Did I wear you out on the onions? <laughs> Do you have any questions on onions? Am I out of time yet? Almost. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. This is garlic. And by the way, I have a a YouTube show on uh, 12 months of, of tomatoes and peppers. And I have another YouTube show out there for garlic and, and onions for the whole 12 months. It goes from when you plant them to all the way through that. But I just took you through most of it right there. This is garlic. It's almost ready to harvest. Uh, it, you plant garlic in Kentucky in September and the first of October in the fall. It grows about six or eight inches and then winter hits and it just tries to survive the winter, it doesn't grow anymore, and it looks kind of crappy until spring. And when spring hits, then it takes off again. Very uh, aggressive plant. This is, it's they're really nice plants, and they get two feet, two and a half feet tall. And uh, when it's almost time to harvest, they'll send up a, a seed pod, and they're really beautiful. Sometimes they do little curly curlicues and stuff, and, and people. Uh, cut them and dry them and use them in, uh, in flower arrangements. You don't want to use them in the green state because they smell, smell to high heaven, I'm telling you. But you cut that off, that seed pod, long seed pod deal, you cut it off because you don't want the strength of the, the energy of the plant going into the, the seeds. You want them to go into the, the bulb in the ground. And you do plant garlic in the ground. So you want to have nice, friable, sandy maybe soil where it has chance to, to, to bulb out and get bigger and bigger. Okay, after that, you wait for your plants to start turning yellow and brown. And when they get mostly yellow and brown, it's time to, time to dig them. You can't pull them. You can pull onions out because they're bulbs on top of the ground, but garlic, you don't want to pull garlic up uh, 
most of the time because you might break off the, the uh, neck and it'll, it, will, it won't cure right. So go ahead and dig the, the garlic. Cut the tops off uh, right away if you want to about an inch of the, for an inch of the stem. Now there's two different kinds of stems of the soft neck and the hard neck. I like the hard neck the best. You know, it's different people. I just talked to a girl the other day, like the soft neck, that's okay. And there is uh, elephant garlic, which is my favorite, which that's what I mostly grow. This is almost all elephant garlic with some German, red German uh, garlic in there also. You can tell a big difference in the seed pod and the size and the color of the plant. Elephant garlic, I've been told, is really not garlic. Well, it sure looks <laughs> like it. It's, it's a lot bigger bulb, and it's a little bit milder than regular garlic. And you want to do the same thing with it as you did with the onions. You don't want to leave it out in the sun, and you don't want to get it wet. Keep it dry again, and you can store those in room temperature as long as it's dry. Don't put it in the refrigerator, and you don't need to keep it in the heat. This regular... Uh, Nice, even cool, maybe uh, somewhat. Okay, any questions on garlic? Next slide. Okay, this this is, uh, there's some, I don't know if you can see it or not, but right up the closest to the camera is uh, some dill plants that are six feet tall. But then there's the, the first, uh, is cucumbers the first uh, and then there's some squash on the other side of the cucumber the cucumbers are on these these tripods things cucumbers like to climb they really like to climb so give them something to climb on um they'll climb all the way to the top right now there's there's the, the, you, that took this picture a, a week ago and they're already almost at the top of that tp already the cucumbers haven't had any cucumbers uh, ripen yet but i've got some that are almost size to pick I, but the, the squash, on the other hand, will not climb. Don't, don't give it anything to climb because it's not going to climb. Um, the squash, uh, I've already eaten a couple of things out of the squash pot. I did zucchini and crookneck yellow. I'm going to, once the onions come out of the ground, I'm going to plant acorn squash all up and down that bed over there. And I've also got some more or late tomatoes and peppers I'm putting in too. Um, the squash, when you spray the uh, fungicide on the tomatoes and peppers, you need to spray the squash also. Uh, it gets pow powdery white, uh, powdery mildew on the leaves. They turn white and then they fall over. And you also have what is a stem borer where you go to bed at night and the plant looks great. And then they wake up in the morning and it's laying over dead. Every, all the limbs and leaves are wilted and everything. And then you look at the stem and right down to the soil level and, and little burger Bur barreled into that stem and killed that plant overnight. Um, and I just got one more thing to say about the, the squash. Uh, I hate killing squash plants. Uh, when I plant two or three seeds in one spot, hoping for one of them to live and then two or three of them live, I, I sometimes have a hard time killing those plants. You can transplant them. Uh, I found out that's, that's, that's not a bad way to do it. But if you, if you crowd them too much, Last year I did that and I didn't get any fruit heart at all. And I was told by somebody as smarter than I am that in order to get the fruit, of course, you gotta get the pollinators, gotta get in there and get those uh, uh, cross pollinating those, those blooms. And if they plant them too tight together and it's too hard for those pollinators to get in there, uh, you're not gonna get any fruit. So don't plant them too close together, get them a little bit of room. Okay, well, don't forget uh, I've had fun. Uh, I hope you've learned something. Uh, uh, don't forget to go to the YouTube if you want and type in my name. Um, and don't forget you are a uh, Garden Club of Kentucky member and you're also uh, the SAR member and you're also a National Garden Club member and check out those websites. They're wonderful websites, wonderful websites. I have a question. Okay. I have tried, I love eggplant. I have tried for years to grow eggplant and you never see flea beetles in our garden on anything else. But if you plant an eggplant plant, 
they come from Georgia and North Carolina <laughs> and attack my little eggplants. Is there anything other than just drenching them in, in uh, pesticide? I've never had that trouble before. Okay. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess I'm lucky. Uh, I'm not a big eggplant eater, so I don't plant very many eggplants. I, I didn't plant any this year. Um, I, I take, I've got a couple books I could go to and probably find out the answer, but you can Google it. Uh, if you, if that would be, and that's the bad thing about my job doing it today. If you could get everything I said off of Google, probably if you had time to, to sit down and, and look at it. But uh, you could go to your one of your search with Yahoo or whatever you got and ask that same question. Uh, but I, I, I think it's probably going to take a bunch of insecticide. And I hate doing that, but uh, do, they come at certain, do they come at a certain time? Do they, do they come as soon as you plant the, plant the thing? Does they get on there right away? Or yes, yes. Immediately. Yes, and they bring their friends. <laughs> Party time. Yeah. Well, I don't know what else to do unless you, if, if you, as soon as you plant it, you could put, you could spray some seven or something on there. Uh, seven, seven isn't as dangerous as a lot of other things. Um, that's what I would use if I was, it was in my garden, I'd use seven. Okay. Uh, I've got to do that with my, my broccoli and my cabbage because the worms will, will, will eat my broccoli and cabbage up right away. So I, I have to keep kind of a, a coating of seven on them all the time. Yeah. Not initially, but when, once they start doing really well, I've got to, worms come in. So yeah, I hate to say it, but that's, that's the only thing I can say. If you're, but there may be some other things out there, but I don't think there will be, sorry. Yeah. Thank you for your onion information. You can Google things, but it's good to have someone who has experienced certain things with plants. Yes, trial and error, I'll tell you. <laughs> and sometimes yes. the trials are bad. <laughs> like my, I, my nitrogen on my plants that one year, that was really sad. Okay, thank you. Um, and any other questions on even vegetables that we didn't cover? Where do you store your garlic? Do you just put it in your pantry or your garage or where do you store yes. it? I grow just, in, I know about how much I need to grow for, for cooking mm -hmm. and for next year to plant. Okay. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take what I need to plant and I'll put it in one basket and I'll put the other stuff that's available to use for cooking in another basket. And we're still using the, the garlic in cooking right now from, from last year's batch. So okay. it keeps really well. And I, you're exactly right. I keep, it, I keep the garlic in my pantry in a, in a, in a little basket. It's not, and some people, I guess, eat a lot of garlic. They may have to put it somewhere else, but a, a, about 12 by 12 foot basket, uh, about half to three fourths full is about all the garlic I, I need. And yeah, that's where, that's where I keep it. And it's onions, I used to put it, put those in, uh, in big baskets too, and just put them in far, I've got a place in the far corner of my kitchen where I store stuff and I'd have all these baskets of white onions and yellow onions and red onions. Uh, and I, I hate to plant them, get them three or four deep, but that's the way they are. And they're, I eat the red onions first because they don't seem to last as long. They don't keep as long as the yellow and the white. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see which color lasts the longest. Uh, but they'll last me up to Christmas. You know, we'll have onions out uh, of the garden all the way up through Christmas. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I thank you for having me. Uh, I hope I didn't overdo it. <laughs> oh, it's very I my interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming.